when you when you take them to court or or when they're suspended or these things happen, uh, it continues to happen and nothing really happens to the police officer. They can go to another district and mm -hmm. get hired. Uh, and you still have the same policies and the same thing happens over and over. So uh, we have the, the legislation to say this is wrong. It's still being violated with the consequences. Right, right. So, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Well, maybe our criminal justice committee here in Rochester can uh, spearhead that and, and come up with a solution. Yeah, that would, that would be wonderful. That would be, yeah. There certainly is a lot of support out there. There is. Yeah. There is. I had a I had a lawyer that called and said, uh, I said, you know, he just wants to uh, join, and uh, well, he didn't say join. He said he wants to help in any kind of way he can. So I gotta get back with him. But um, she, she, a lot of people interested in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Did they do their um, police reform? The governor's, um, he had put out the um, executive order for police to re to look at their police departments and make improvements. Have they done that? I don't know what improvements they have made. They came up with uh, with this pick uh, uh, person in crisis. Um, I don't know how well that's working because they didn't show up for this nine-year-old girl. So mm -hmm. you have... you. <laughs> You have these things in place, but how well are they working? Right. They feel, you know, you, you can suspend somebody, uh, then they take their kids down to Disney World and have a good time and come back. Uh, and if anyone gets fired, to go to another district. So yeah, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of things in place. That my point is that it's not being followed, and there are no consequences. Yeah. yeah, that's what we find in Rome. They're not they're not following their own policies. Right. So yeah, that's that's an ongoing battle, though, unfortunately. It is something. How is it? It says, oh, look at that dang thing. Hold up, let me, who's not muted? Hold up, hold up, hold up. What happened? Can everyone please, um, hi, Barbara. Please mute. Mm -hmm. Who did? Mm -hmm. I ain't touching nothing. Can they hear us? That's the mic. 
It says mute. No, your mic is on. Okay, so what's happening? I don't know. But I'm off there. I can't see myself. Uh, I actually can hear you. Uh, is that the, is that Reverend Jones? Yes, it is. Good to meet you. <laughs> hey, hey nice why. to meet you. Can you see me? I can see you, but now, now you, have right. to put on, you have to put on no. mute now. I can hear you too. <laughs> okay, I'm not on mute. I'm all right, right? No, you need to put it on mute right now, and then uh, then we'll come back to you. We're gonna we're gonna let a few more people uh, come in, huh? and then uh, then we'll get started. Okay. Oh, not yet. But you didn't say yet. Did you say put it on mute now? Put the volume down. Put the volume down. Yes, put it on mute now, and then, uh, and then, uh, yes, put it on mute now, please. Yep, you're good. Hi, John. It's clear. How are you? Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Good, good. I think we are going to kick this off in one minute. Hi, Karen. Hi, Claire, John, and everybody else, Sonda, Rochester. I am here. <laughs> Fine. I'm I'm being a good steward and I'm muting, so I'm muting, so I will unmute when I have to speak. <laughs> okay. Um Hello, everybody. I'm John Singleton, uh, president of the NAACP Rochester Branch 2172. I'm calling the meeting to order today, 2-20-21 at 12.07 PM. We're going to start off uh, with the opening prayer. Uh, Reverend Jones, you're going to do that for us, right? And yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you well. Okay, yes. Father God, we just thank you for this unity, Father, that we have, Father.
the Reverend is muted. Amen. You are muted, Reverend. All right. Oh, I'm okay. I'm okay now. You're okay I'm now. Right. You were muted. I'm a muted. You were muted, but now you're good. We can hear you now. Okay, you couldn't hear me then. I couldn't hear you, sir. Wow. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. You. He's back on mute, John. Yes, uh, you're. I think he might be doing the opposite with his controls. So as a host, we can mute and unmute. So whoever is the host could be able to unmute and mute him if we need to. Okay, what's going on? I, don't touch anything. We can hear you now. You You're okay, Reverend? Yep. Well, I'm, just, I'm going to just ask the Father to touch us this year and from now on to bless us and let us do the right thing that he want us to do because this is his world. Father, we just thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, amen. Amen. We, we're uh, uh, few of us aren't that savvy, but uh, we appreciate that, Reverend. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Pradier, uh, you're going to... Uh, First, do we have any volunteers to uh, to sing uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing? Mm -hmm. I just preach. <laughs> <laughs> no volunteers. Uh, Dr. Pridey, do you have that recorded? Did I lose Dr. Pridier? Okay, uh, let's move forward. We have no meet, no minutes from the uh, the last uh, meeting. When they started calling it the Black National Anthem, it was the Negro National Anthem. It's something that we grew up with. He and I grew up in different parts of the country, though we're married. But Black people grew up knowing this as our National Anthem is called Lift Every Voice and Sing. Dave, who's the educator, will give you a little more information <laughs> about the origins and dates. Lift Every Voice and Sing was actually uh, started out as a poem by James Weldon Johnson. And in 1899, which I just said that year, because that was the year of the birth of uh, Duke Ellington, the great Duke Ellington, his brother, uh, J. Rosamond Johnson, uh, put the poem to music. Is something going on? So, okay, uh, we got a glitch there, unfortunately. So, I'm going to move forward. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, going to introduce our uh, uh, knowledge our guests that are here with us today. New York State Conference, second 
Vice President, uh, Ms. Karen Blanding, New York State Conference Secretary, Ms. Claire Theobalds, thank you for both being here. And uh, we have a representative from Rome, uh, the President, uh, Ms. Jacqueline Nelson. Uh, Ms. Blanding will later be uh, doing the swearing in for us. And uh, the President of Rome, NAAC branch, uh, will be giving us some facts about COVID-19, something that the NAACP has been pushing uh, for quite some time. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with the NAACP. However, when, uh, when we fight for freedom and we fight for uh, against discrimination, we gotta be alive to enjoy that. So these, uh, the vaccine and, uh, will help us a lot with that and uh, we have to be protected. So we're gonna get some facts on that. Um, later in the, uh, in this general assembly meeting, I'm gonna to speak to everyone about membership. Uh, Mr. Johnson is also gonna talk about that, but I'm talking about the joining committees and the, the way we're gonna move forward with this new branch. Let me rephrase that. The way we're gonna move forward with this reintegrated branch that's, uh, that's been out there in action for nine years, uh, we're gonna do that through our committee. And we have, we have a, a, a over 16 committees. We have a few that are active now with chair people and we need more chair people. We also need people sitting on those committees. Um, and, and it is one thing to say, uh, you can sit back and say, why did the NAACP Rochester Brank go in that particular direction? And those are legitimate questions that you should be asking. Uh, what I prefer is for you to be on the committee and, and help us going though in a proper direction because you're in the community, you're, you're with the people yeah, and we, we are servants for the people. So we're gonna get into that a little bit more in detail. So I'm gonna introduce uh, our conference, uh, New York State Conference Second Vice President, Karen Blanding for our swearing in. The people we're gonna swear in first, Ms. Blanding, let me, let me uh, touch on the people that we're gonna be swearing in. Uh, first, we have Ms. Uh, Ms. Kira Hudson. Uh, she's the assistant treasurer. Uh, she's been with us since uh, since we uh, since January, uh, and she's been an active member of the executive committee. So she just missed the Sarin in uh, ceremony. Next, we have Ms. Amber Noel. Uh, we she's now the chair of the health committee and she's gonna be sworn in as an at-large uh, committee, uh, executive committee person. Um, I attended a webinar last night uh, with Ms. Noel, and uh, she was interviewing a doctor, and uh, she did a very good job, but she has a, a website, she's doing webinars. I was uh, uh, very appreciative that she invited me to see her work. Uh, then we have Reverend Roy Jones. Uh, Reverend Roy Jones was a part of Gen the Geneva NAACP. Now he's a part of the Rochester NAACP. Uh, he's he's uh, he's going to chair the Armed Services and Veterans Affairs Committee, and uh, he's going to be sworn in as an at-large executive committee person. And Reverend Jones, uh, he's got forty plus. Well, let's just say he's got decades of service uh, helping veterans get jobs, homes, uh, so forth. Uh, Reverend Jones also is a disabled veteran. When I made the statement earlier, when I made the comment earlier about people doing extraordinary things, can we mute, please? Okay, thank you. Well, when I made the statement earlier about ordinary people doing extraordinary things, uh, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, the people, these three people that are about to be sworn in. I mean, we look at Rochester, New York, and uh, we had the Underground Railroad come to Rochester, New York. Um, we had the Underground Railroad come through Rochester, New York. Um, so Rochester is on the map. Uh, we have Frederick Douglass. Um, he didn't know his birthday, so he chose Valentine's Day. The, the airport has been named after uh, Frederick Douglass. Those are those are uh, extraordinary people, but they belong uh, that they belong to Rochester, the United States, and the world. So we have, but we're our ordinary people doing extraordinary things. 
three people right here, they, they are taking time away from their loved ones. They're taking time away from, from others to volunteer. And the NAACP is a volunteer organization to volunteer to help, not the NAACP, but to help the community through the NAACP. So these are extraordinary people, uh, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. We appreciate that. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, Vice President Blanding, uh, you have the floor. Good afternoon, um, NAAC Rochester branch. It is great to see y'all after nine years, as Mr. Singleton said, up and running. I want to bring greetings on behalf of our state conference president, Hazel and Deuce, who could not be here today. As you know, it's a national board meeting annually. She is not only on the national board, I mean, the state conference president, she's on the national board. And yes, we had, I, some of you did join us this morning for the annual report from 9 to 12. Ms. Dukes also have a meeting from 12 to 1. And then you're all welcome to go back with the annual board, but you will not be able to speak this afternoon. But to get it um, moving on, I'm going to um, swear you in. How we're going to do is going to be very simple. It's very thing. I'm going to say I and everyone that's being sworn in today, I believe it's Ms. Hudson, Ms. Noel, and Reverend Jones will then say their name and then we will continue. So let's begin. I. 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 So Sarah. say your names. Reverend I. Jones. Noel. Okay. The other one, um, who's it? Um, uh, Amber did it. Um, Ms. Hudson? Kiera Hudson, yes. Okay, say I and say your name. I, Kiera Hudson. And um, Reverend Jones, I and say your name. Reverend jo Roy Jones. Okay, now we can all go together. Uh, um, we're going to repeat after me. Solemnly swear to discharge. Solemnly, solemnly swear, swear to, to discharge. To the best of my ability. To the, to the best, best of my ability. ability. The responsibilities of office. The responsibilities of office. And the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. In the, in the National Association of Advancement of Colored People. In accordance with its constitution and bylaws. In accordance with its constitution and bylaws. And the decision. And the decision. Of its governing bodies. Of its governing bodies. I dedicate myself anew. I dedicate myself anew. To its principles of equality. To its principles of equality. And justice under law. And, and justice, justice under law. law. I shall always try to keep. I shall I always try to keep. The goals of the NAACP. The goals of the NAACP. Of above any purely personal individual. Of purely personal individual. Interest. Interest. That might that might hinder the attainment that might hinder the attainment of those goals of those goals i can i ask the continue help i ask the continue help of almighty god of almighty god in keeping this pledge in keeping this pledge congratulations you all been sworn in thank you so much i'll move back over to mr singleton thank you Thank you, Vice President Blandy. Uh, we appreciate that. And uh, congratulations to all the, the new officers. Now it's time to get some work done. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Um, so there are all the officers that, that represent the Rochester branch. Uh, we're, going to, we're establishing a, a website, and we're going to have the bios, uh, community affairs, uh, and, and such things on that website. And that will be emailed out to the members uh, so they can keep a track of what we're doing. Uh, that's still in progress. So you get to meet the new officers and, uh, and you get to see what we're doing in the community. And also what we'll be doing is uh, the committees will be doing report outs to the general membership because not only we're gonna have it on the website, but at these particular uh, general uh, membership meetings, the cheer people, the chairpersons will actually uh, do their report out and let you know what they're doing, the help they need, and also get uh, some recommendations. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 
now in celebration of Black History Month, uh, Dr. Pradier, uh she's gonna have five minutes to, to give us some facts that she found. Hello, everybody. I'm behind the scenes here. Um, the history that I have for our branch, we know that our branch was um, inactive for almost 10 years, but I wanted to do some research um, on our branch. And I happened to, um, from Monroe County, our Monroe County office here, um, they had an article from the DNC which I then called the DNC, that was published in, on um, June 3rd, 1919. Our branch was actually um, activated or chartered in um, 1919, which we know doing the math was 102 years ago. So we were, I was interested in a birth date. Like I know the Nationals birth date is in February, but I was interested in our birth date for our branch. So, our, this meeting took place June 3rd, 1919, um, well, June 2nd, 1919, and it was published in the DNC, June 3rd, 1919, on page 20. So the branch meeting was a meeting to elect officers, or swear to, off, to elect their officers. Um, the topic of the meeting, or well, the subject of the meeting was urge colored folks to aid meaning they had this community chest, which is now known as United Way. This meeting, the president elected was a G.W. Burks. The vice president was a Mrs. William Max. The secretary was Henry L. Smith. There was no assistant secretary. The treasurer was J. Frank Marshall. And the executive committee um, is listed too. And they also had a Negro, all of this was listed in the Negro Business League of Rochester. So I'm still trying to do this um, tracing of our branch and more would, will be forthcoming with the um, rest of the people on the communications committee, which is gonna be Ms. Piera Hudson. Um, Chaplain Evelyn Giff, um, myself, and we have another um, person, um, Miss Amber Noel. We're gonna move forward with this, try to find out more information for our publicity and for the press and for media, which is our communications. Um, department, should I say, once we get in the building. Okay, so that does it for me, and I would um, put it back in the hands of our president. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pradier, and that's our communications chair. So before we get give it over to the uh, our honored guest from Rome, I have one more thing to, to talk about with Black history. Uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna beat this dead horse. I'm gonna reemphasize uh, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And with that, I'm gonna speak about Mother Mildred Johnson from Rochester, New York. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm gonna read this, so don't fall asleep on me because this is very important. Uh, Mildred Johnson was a longtime civil rights activist in Rochester. Born in Brighton, she attended school in the city and graduated from Old West High School. Her family moved to Washington, D.C. After attending Howard University, Mildred returned to Rochester in 1953 and became active in the local NAACP. In 1960, she opened the Negro Information Center in a home on Baden Street, where she provided food and temporary housing for poor African Americans looking for work. Three years later, she renamed the center after her mother, Virginia Wilson, who was a missionary worker in Rochester. As a child, Mildred had accompanied her mother on her rounds to the jail and settlement houses. Virginia Wilson Helping Hand Center helped to feed and clothe the poor of Rochester. The center was renamed Virginia Wilson Interracial Information and Helping Hand Center in 1972. And some of you probably are familiar with this. 
Johnson was was an early supporter of fight. Uh, I think we got a fight village out there too, right? Uh, so Johnson was an early supporter of fight, freedom, independence, God, honor today during the mid 1960s. She also worked with Action for a Better Community, the Urban League of Rochester and other local organizations, always promoting and advocating the assistance for the poor. Yodrick Johnson was a straight talking individual who spoke her mind in a way that garnered respect. She frequently stood before local judges to advocate for low income Rochesterians. Although not a lawyer, she knew how to navigate the legal systems. Her word was as good as bail sometimes. As a community activist, she met numerous times with former New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller. The pair had an interesting personal relationship. She called him Nelson, and he called her Mrs. Johnson. Mildred Johnson died in 1992 at the age of 80 after a long, after a long time tireless working to improve the lives of countless Rochester residents. At her funeral, former Monroe County legislator Ron Good said she was a mother to hundreds, a grandmother to thousands, and a friend to everyone. There will never be another Mildred Johnson. And uh, I believe today we have uh, uh, a representative of the Johnson family. So this is this is what we mean. So, Hello, how you doing? Hi, okay, that's Philip Johnson, the son and Patricia Johnson, a daughter-in-law. It's good to meet you. You can have a few yes. minutes, please. We are honored that you um, acknowledge my mother-in-law. Uh, we appreciate all that you have done. We thank everyone that sent uh, uh, messages. They, um, how to remember my mother-in-law, Mildred Johnson, what she did for the community. And um, we just, just so happy to be, and we say to thank you, and um, we're never going to forget this. Um, I'll let my husband be. Yeah, my loving wife is doing a wonderful job right now. I just want to talk about it. You got to remember in the 60s when they were riding on, on Joseph Pike, Joseph Avenue, she slowed down and stopped the people from getting beat up and everything else. She had to walk them to a safe place. Y'all just got to stop breaking into places like that. And that's the only thing we got. So they started listening to her. And then all of a sudden, the police came up there. And he said he was a lumbar, whoever it was. And he was the one that helped her to stop them from getting involved with everybody else with craziness. So the dogs and everything. Coming on, go over there and relax. We'll take you. I'll take care. And that was my mother's legacy. And I was there at four years of age. And I was wise enough just to hang around. And I thought I was going to be the, it's going to save her, but the other family members, everybody else just began to respect uh -huh. her immediately. And they started talking things and everything. Y'all go on home. Y'all go home. You're going to tear up our neighborhood. So that was the bottom line. And I felt very humble. Thank you again for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and once again, the, the, uh, Mother Johnson was an ordinary person that actually did all extraordinary things. She got out there in the community and she was helping. Um, so, and now we have the, the, her legacy and we have uh, the people left behind that are trying to do the same thing. So we appreciate you and we appreciate what your mother um, has done for Rochester. And these are, these are things that we need to remember because we do have Frederick Douglass, we do have Harriet and we have a lot of things going on, but we have these people that, that are in Rochester or buildings a name after that we pass by every day and we don't know who these people are or what they have done uh, for our community. And we all can be like that. I don't think many of us are gonna be Frederick Douglass, but we can do, we were ordinary people. And by joining the NAACP or participating in these committees, we can also make our presence known and leave a footprint. Thanks again, Johnson family. Yes, we like to join um, 
NAACP. Be a member. We'll take care of that. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my wife and maybe a couple of my daughters. Um, my sons are working now, but it's a good thing. The, the whole family. <laughs> that's it. That's a good thing. Okay, let's make that happen. All right. Thanks again. You're so welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, uh, Rome President uh, Jacqueline Nelson, uh, you have the the mic and. Uh, uh, the president is going to speak to us about uh, COVID-19. Hi. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> it's not a Zoom meeting if you don't have glitches. So just you, you need to know that first out of the shoot here. Okay. Um, I'm very honored to be here to, um, um, to step in for Dr. Hazel and Dukes. Um, just a brief background about me. I was born and raised in Rome. I've been a member of the Rome Brants for um, close to 25 years. I have served in different um, capacities as chair of education, health, um, legal redress. I've been secretary and now the last um, seven years I've been the president. Um, I did look at your agenda for today and you want just the facts, I guess. Well, I'm, I'm kind of here to tell you that the facts are pretty grim and I think that everyone is aware of that if you've been paying attention to the news and what the doctors are saying. Um, we all know that the virus started in China and it quickly spread all around the world and it has put us to our knees here in the United States. Um, and it has hit no other community harder than it's hit the African-American community and other minorities. Um, COVID-19 has hit our communities financially, physically, mentally, and if you own a business, you're probably struggling. Um, infection rates are higher for Blacks and Hispanics and Latinas because of our occupations, um, less social distancing, um, where we live, um, where we work, where we shop, and parts of the, of the country are hit hardest because um, of larger populations of, of Blacks and other minorities. Um, now, add that into the fact that the African American community has the lowest rate of vaccinations among, among any ethnic group. This is largely due to hesitancy, um, mistrust, doubts, and then the lack of accessibility to the vaccine. It's important that everyone knows and it's important that the NAACP educate our folks that um, black scientists played a major role in developing the vaccine. They played a major role in um, ac um, acknowledging the use of the vaccine. Um, they work for Pfizer, they work for Madeira and the vaccines are safe. Now, I'm not gonna tell you that there's no side effects. I don't know if anybody's here had, have, has had the vaccine. Um, I've had both as a healthcare worker. Um, and just from personal experience and those around me that I've seen, um, the first shot I got, I, my arm was very sore for a couple of days. And then the second one I got was, I felt achy like I was gonna get the flu and my arm was sore. Some people have less symptoms, some people have a little more, but this outweighs of getting really sick and ending up in the You went mute. and access to being able to actually register for the sites, the lack of Wi-Fi, um, the lack of being able to navigate the internet. And it's important that branches of the NAACP get a seat at the table. The state and the county are making decisions where, when, and who gets the vaccine. And we need to be sitting there when these decisions are being made. So I could tell you what Rome has done. I'm a member of the New York State COVID-19 Equity Task Force, which was formed by the governor's office, as well as the Oneida County. Um, that's the county we in. I'm understanding you, you guys are in Monroe County. 
um, Equity Task Force. Um, we continue to educate our members and the community with, um, we do media interviews. Um, last week, we held a virtual town hall at which we had black doctors, um, a black respiratory therapist. We had our county executive and our county health director. And we asked the questions of where, when, why, and who. We also um, was part of planning a hub where people were vaccinated. We did a phone tree to make sure that we were calling our seniors and we were registering them. Um, some of them did not have computers. They did not have printers. So we printed out their, um, their um, registration forms and we took them to the site and we gave them to them, to them as they arrived. We had the sheriff's office have um, sheriffs in the parking lot to help our seniors into the building with wheelchairs. I mean, these are just some of the things that you could do. I would suggest that you reach out to, um, you should have a governor's liaison and I did look it up for you and I will put his name um, in the chat where you could email him and um, Miss Noel, you could start a conversation with him and see if you can get on some of these committees or someone on your health committee can get on the committee and actually start helping to make decisions because we know our people. Um, I, um, Rome is a small town. Um, we are, we're only 7% African American and we are working really hard because we are often overlooked. So I am, I am up in the police station. I am in the mayor's office. I am in the county executive's office. We are doing everything we can to make sure that, that the people of color in the city are, are um, part of whatever planning is going on and stuff. And I'm sure you guys have more people. I'm impressed you have 39 people at your meeting today. Wow, yay, Rochester. That's a great start. Um, we struggle with that. And we have people that will do the work. We just got to get them there to do the work and stuff. So you guys are doing um, an awesome job. And I'm so happy for you that you've reactivated the branch and that you're doing it. And if there's anything that Rome could do or any information we could share, we're here. We're just down the throughway. Um, we could help you. Um, and like I said, um, Ms. Noel, if you want to reach out to us, we could um, ex tell you what we've done, what we said, what letters we've written to get people to encourage and I just want to remind everyone to wash your hands, wear a mask, social distance, and when it's your turn, get vaccinated. And you know, if you have any questions, if you're hesitant, always, always talk to your doctor. You know, listen to your healthcare professionals and trust the science. So thank you for having me. If anyone has any questions I can answer, I'd be glad to. Um, I just sent my question directly to you. Um, I, I didn't get your name, but I sent my question. Oh, I'm sorry. I know. I'm Jacqueline Nelson or Jackie okay. Nelson. Yep. I, I'll put, I could put my contact information in the chat for you, but I didn't see where your question went to. Um, I sent it directly to your chat. Okay. Can you tell I'm really good at this? <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. <laughs> do you want to, could you ask me it now or do you want to, cause I can't, I don't see it, honey. I don't. Um, well, it was just really to follow up with the importance of taking the vaccine and the vaccination. Um, and so my presentation actually talks more about that, but I would love to connect with you and the other people that you mentioned. So I sent over my contact information. Oh, okay. You. All right. Yep. I'm putting mine in right now. So if there's anything else, definitely we will be glad to help. And I will put um, um, the gentleman that is um, your contact to the governor's office as well. Um, we have a young lady here that I just call up. Um, in fact, she was really helpful, helpful for us to getting the hub in Rome because we know where, where our folks can get to like bus routes um, and things like that to get the vaccine. Um, we know like who's gonna um, need help or what community center is, is to use and stuff. And we ended up using a local community college that was like in the middle of the city. 
so that people could get to could, our seniors because it was for 65 and older and now they've opened it up to people that have um pre-exist pre-existing conditions so right now we're working on doing it again to reach out to those people so that's why it's so important that we are at the table so that we could tell them you know no we're not going to put it at the country club at the end of the city because nobody could get there you know you need to put it where our folks are where where our people go the recreation center uh, one of our things is the ymca here in rome um we have a, a church that is in downtown that's in walking distance for everyone um we have a housing um um house housing project where a lot of people are we're trying to get it at the recreation center there and stuff so that we could reach out to their people and the governor is actually given directives that it there is to be equity in getting out the vaccine so it's up to us to make sure that it's done especially with our county because and and you know and i'm not trying to be funny or anything but we're also a republican county so i mean we've got all kinds of things stacked here so that that that's just what we do <laughs> Not that I have an issue with Republicans. Okay, but well, thanks for all the information. <laughs> that was, uh, Sometimes. <laughs> that was, uh, you gave us the facts, and we appreciate okay. it. Okay, I hope I did. I hope I helped or answered some questions. Um, whatever I, whatever we could do. Great, and, uh, and our new health chair has your information, so I'm sure she's gonna be making contact. Okay. Um, great, thanks Thank again. you for having me. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, and speaking of our new health chair, uh, Ms. Amber Noel, uh, you have the floor for your uh, COVID-19 presentation. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm President Singleton. Um, I know that Dr. Pradia is getting ready to bring up my presentation. And... Um, If you scroll up just a little bit, um, you can get to the very first page. There you go. Okay, um, so health education is extremely key, the pandemic in black history. And so this particular presentation will give you guidance, data and historical facts. It is presented to chapter 2172 of the NAACP. And of course, I'm Amber Noel. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the table of contents um, is as follows. Um, you'll be seeing historical facts. You'll be seeing um, something called keep in mind, black history, pandemic timeline, symptoms data, uh, preparation, black health pioneers, groups at risk, testing methods, next steps and what to do if you do become positive, mask usage, why should we vaccinate as a black community, and lastly, preventative measures. Next slide, please. So let's talk about where we began as black people. Um, I wanna bring up James McCoon Smith. I actually, with all transparency, I actually just learned about him last week. And um, James McCoon Smith, born um, April 18th, 1813, um, and uh, passing away on November 17th, 1865, was an American physician um, and about abolitionist. Um, you can find out more about um, James McCoon Smith if you uh, end up Googling him. And let's go ahead and move on to the next slide for keep in mind. All right, so keep in mind, the pandemic is not a word to use lightly or care carelessly. It is a word that if misused can cause unreasonable fear or unjustified acceptance acceptance that the fight is over, leading to unnecessary suffering and death. And that was said by Dr. Tedros Adhanam from the World Health Organization Director General. Next slide, please. And so I wanna talk about the first black female physician. Her name is Rebecca Cole. Uh, for many decades, credit for being the first black female physician in the U.S. She went to Rebecca Cole, M.D., who graduated from the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania in 1867. Next slide, please.
So next um, is inventors inside of our history. I don't know if you guys know about Sarah Boone. Um, and Sarah Boone was a 19th century African-American dressmaker who was also awarded a patent for her improved ironing board. We have next Rebecca Lee Crumpler. Um, Crumpler um, was born Rebecca Davis. She was an American physician, nurse, and author. After studying at the New England Female Medical College in 1864, she became the first African-American woman to become a doctor of medicine in the United States. Lastly, we have um, Marie Van Britten Brown. She was the inventor of the home security system in 1966, along with her husband, Albert Brown. In the same year, they jointly applied for a patent which was granted in 1969. Brown was born in Jamaica, Queens, New York. She died there at the age of 76. Beautiful women. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the timeline and how we got to the pandemic. Um, the timeline of emerging diseases in 1429 to 1427 BC, the plague of Athens. And then I'll just skip through that. Um, there are different uh, sections of where the pandemic hit us in the United States and how hard it hit us. I'll go ahead and skip to the Zika virus and then to the Ebola virus, the measles, and then we're in our present day COVID-19, which as we all can, ex um, can attest to that it's pretty uh, gruesome here uh, experiencing the COVID-19. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk about the um, symptoms and some data for COVID-19. Well, it's said per the CDC, if you experience fever, chills, and cough, be sure to get tested as soon as you're able to avoid, to avoid any preventable spreads. Secondly, if you have muscle ache or fatigue, uh, those people may be symptomatic. Uh, for those people who are, it's best you get tested and quarantine as soon as possible to avoid the spread. And thirdly, if you have a loss of taste or smell, this is one of the many symptoms you can experience if you've contracted the virus. However, some people are asymptomatic. Next slide, please. Okay, so according to um, uh, the stats on CDC, we currently have a total number of 28 million cases worldwide as of February 2021. Um, and we have 495,000 deaths to date in the entire United States. Next slide, please. So I wanted to put some stats here that um, are more privy to Rochester, Monroe County. We have 51,256 total reported tests and we have 90, 968 COVID-19 related deaths in Monroe County to date. Next slide, please. All right, so let's talk about increases for black patients. Uh, black Americans are infected with COVID-19 at nearly three times the rate of white Americans, according, according to a new document from the National Urban League. The report based on data from John Hopkins University also shows black Americans are twice as likely to die from the virus. According to the state of black America, the infection rate for blacks is 62 per, uh, per 10,000 compared with 23 per 10,000 for whites. Uh, the rest, you can probably get that from me if you email me and let's go ahead to the next slide. Okay, so for testing positive for past and current infections, anytime you do test positive, it's always important to prepare for 14 days of seclusion. That will support your mental and physical upkeep, the types of drinks and food you'll eat, books you'll read, other activities that will keep your physical up, physique up to par during your healing process. It's always good to make preventative care uh, uh, a list on what you may need, such as, I gave some examples here, inhalers. Uh, Wi-Fi accessibility, massagers, heating pads, communicative or uh, communication access, et cetera. Next slide, please. So these I'll go through pretty quickly. I just wanted to basically put some more black history facts out to you guys. And I'm pretty sure you guys may have already heard of these people. Firstly, I'd like to introduce Dan, Daniel Hell Williams. Uh, he, uh, after uh, apprenticing uh, with a surgeon, Daniel Hell Williams earned a medical degree and started working as a surgeon in Chicago in 1884. Because of discrimination, hospitals at that time um, uh, beard uh, black doctors from working on staff, unfortunately. So Dr. Williams opened the nation's first black owned interracial hospital. If you wanna learn more about him, you can Google him. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Secondly, I do have Ben Carson. 
Um, you may have known him for running for president at one point, and before he did so, uh, he was a secretary of housing and urban development. He also was a world famous pioneering brain surgeon. Uh, growing up in a single parent home in Detroit, uh, Carson graduated high school with a scholarship to Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. If you want to know, learn more, you can always Google him. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have ja Jacqueline Elders, 1990, 1933. Uh, when she heard a speech by Edith Irby Jones, the first African-American to be accepted as a non-segregated student at the University of Arkansas Medical School, she was inspired to become a doctor. Uh, moving forward, she actually uh, attended medical school and um, on the GI Bill where she met her husband, uh, Oliver Elders, uh, Dr. Elders, went on to become the first board certified pediatric endocrinologist in the state of Arkansas in 1978. Next slide, please. All right, we have Jane Cook Wright, the daughter of one of the first African-American graduates of Harvard Medical School. Wright grew up with a keen interest in healthcare. Her father, Dr. Lewis Wright, was also the first black doctor appointed to a staff position at a municipal hospital in New York City. And in 1929, the city hired him as a police surgeon. You can find out more about these two if you Google them. Next slide, please. Solomon Carter Fuller. Um, he, he actually, uh, the Fuller's grandparents were medical missionaries in Liberia. Um, he had a lot to do with the um, psychiatric part of history for Black people and really the, the entire world. Um, he had a, a big um, a place in the Alzheimer's disease field, schizophrenia, depression, mental illnesses. Um, and so he was a um, true pioneer to our culture. So if you want to find out more about him, you can also Google him. Next slide, please. All right, so we have some um, um, target groups at risk, especially in our community, citizens and uh, senior citizens and children. We also have individuals, individuals with health conditions and disabilities. And then lastly, we also have uh, pregnant and breastfeeding women. Um, they're more susceptible to um, getting the virus as well. Next slide, please. The available testing methods are as follows. And so we have viral testing, which is what most of you may know of, where you would um, get that test done through your nose. And then we have the antibody test, which is what you'll get through your bloodstream. Um, so a lot of that stuff you can find out also on Google. Uh, so with the respect of time, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Okay, so next steps, what do you do if you test positive? Well, you can track your system, um, your symptoms. You can stay indoors at all costs. You can isolate, rest and hydrate. You can also inform your doctor as soon as possible. Next slide, please. Let's talk about proper mask use. Well, um, the first obvious um, picture there with that particular slide is with a young lady with her mask over her nose. And then the picture that you may not see right now, um, maybe because of, oh no, you do see it. Um, this is with an improper mask use with her mask under her mouth. Next slide, please. And so I like this particular slide because it talks about why should we vaccinate as Blacks? Um, well, race and ethnicity are risk markers for other underlying conditions that affect health, including socioeconomic status, access to healthcare, and exposure to the virus related to occupation, frontline, essential, and critical infrastructure workers. Black Americans are infected with COVID-19 at nearly three times the rate of white Americans, according to a new document from the National Urban League. The report based on data from John Hopkins University also shows Black Americans are twice as likely to die from the virus according to the state of Black America. So some of this stuff I've, I had already um, mentioned in the beginning. And then lastly, I just want to say 73 um, per 10,000. During the early months of the pandemic, the report asserts that Blacks were more likely to have pre-existing conditions that predispose them to COVID-19 infection. So I think that would put us more, um, uh, we should consider the vaccination a lot more uh, based on those stats. Next slide, please. So preventative measures to practice. You always want to social distance six feet apart. You, are, um, you always want to wear your gloves. Um, the things are not showing up on your slide, but they are on my, on my screen. And so we have social distancing, distancing six feet uh, apart. We have wearing your gloves, at least while you're pumping gas. And we also have face covers the proper way. Um, we also have regular cleaning and disinfecting, regularly washing your hands. It helps prevent the spread to yourself and others. 
And the last slide is just um, introducing myself as Amber Noel to everyone and letting you guys know. Next slide, please. Uh, I am committed to your health and the presentation's information was brought to you by CDC, um, World Health Organization, and the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy Office of the Vice President for Research at University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. Thank you guys. Good summer. Great, okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Noel. You're I welcome. Think we covered, I think we covered COVID-19 pretty much. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, now we're gonna go into membership. Uh, Mr. Richard Johnson, he's the chair of the, uh, of the membership and lifetime membership committee. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Yes, how's everybody doing? Uh, thank you for Ms. Blanding, President of Rome, Jackie Nelson, uh, the Secretary, Ms. Threshold, thank you for coming. Thank you for everybody for coming. I just had a question first. It is approaching one o'clock. I don't know, you know, is it all right for me to go forth? Yes. I don't know please. if anybody else had commitments to one o'clock. So I just want to be respectful of everybody's time. Yes, so, so to pull out, they will, uh, Mr. Johnson. All right. So um, I'm going to be quick. Um, my whole report is just based on um, just initial steps in my vision of what I have uh, in store for this year or these next two years um, as far as membership and, recruit and recruitment. Um, the committee consists right now of four people, myself as a chair, uh, my wife, Sharita Trawick, uh, the secretary, the branch secretary, Chaplain Nikita Pradier, and Mr. Vandell Marshall. But we always are looking for more um, uh, to be involved with membership. So our time commitment could be spread out amongst uh, things that we are doing. Um, as of right now, confirmed by the branch secretary, our uh, enrollment is at 193 members. And we are here, our committee is here to ensure that we're going to keep that growing um, with the help of every member of the NAACP here in Rochester. Um, our purpose will, um, for the committee uh, is a mission to engage with the community and recruit general, professional, and corporate members who will be actively involved in the NAACP through the Rochester branch. Our community engagement will ensure that every current and potential member understands the mission of the NAACP on the, on the branch, state, and national level. Along with the general um, community, along with recruiting general, the general community, uh, we'll be looking to recruit, uh, but not held to, uh, 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 lawyers, politicians, um, local corporations, small businesses, healthcare professionals, um, members of association and organizations. Uh, the member and lifetime membership committee will also continue to engage our members to work alongside with us in effort to be one of the many ways to be active in the Rochester community and be active with the NAACP branch of Rochester. Uh, a little bit about engagement. Uh, mostly uh, right now, presentations and events is my vision um, to help hold presentations to groups uh, that want to learn uh, more about membership or the NAACP and or being involved with events, whether it be an NAACP event or uh, I could be part, or, or the committee can be part of uh, an event held in the community or um, uh, in some aspect of. Um, uh, I got lost for words, uh, in relation to um, our community. Uh, the member, um, the membership, lifetime membership committee will be making active efforts in participating in community and other events in person and virtual for recruitment of members. A strategic plan will be formed to advertise recruitment and events um, we participate in 
uh, with current branch members in the Rochester, uh, greater Rochester area. Our presentations will have a three-pronged approach. Uh, the three main points are history, uh, the national mission of the NAACP and the local chapter's vision here in Rochester. Uh, the committee will be working close with all committees to ensure we are putting our best effort forth to recruit active members to build a strong membership for our branch here in Rochester. And last but not least, uh, our next steps as of right now um, uh, is you know, recruiting more members, um, creating a plan for recruitment uh, and making a calendar um, to share with members of events and of things that the committee is doing um, and establishing uh, quarterly goals of membership recruitment, which I will be reporting on monthly um, how we're doing uh, moving forward. Uh, our first committee meeting is to be announced. I'll be working with the secretaries um, to get that out to everybody um, that is interested in joining and, and helping the effort to recruit members uh, and not to hold anybody, not to try, not to talk to their friends and families to become a member. Um, uh, and like I, like I said, we'll be um, having quarterly goals as well as monthly goals. Thank you for your time. And I hope I wasn't uh, too long. That's perfect, Mr. Johnson. Thank you very much. Um, so bear with me for maybe five minutes and we'll be able to close this out. Uh, I have some last words. Um, we have some, we have current committee uh, that, uh, that need chairs and also need membership. And I'm gonna emphasize the point again the way the Rochester NAACP branch and, and uh, most branches uh, are effective in the community is through their committees. If we're looking at criminal justice reform, we have a committee for that. We're looking at some, some discrepancies in education. Uh, we have a committee for that. Uh, we have a health committee as, as uh, uh, Ms. Amber Knoll just uh, presented some COVID information, labor and industry, uh, armed services and veterans affairs, when it comes to our, to our great veterans. So, and there are many, many more committees and this is going on our website. So uh, when I was younger and we need young people as well. When I was younger, I would have the question, why didn't the NAACP go in this particular direction? Why didn't the Urban League go in this particular direction? Well, now for you young people and everyone else, uh, you can actually ask that question within the committee, sitting on a committee and actually directing the committee in particular ways. So a committee is a, is a group of people. So uh, they're all gonna have voices. They're all gonna have uh, ideas, but they're working for the, com the community. The community will let us know what we really need to do or, or what their needs in their particular local area will be. So we need people on the committees. You all are members. Remember the, the, remember the statement, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. We all may not be Frederick Douglass, but we may get close to being like, uh, like Mother Johnson and just doing things starting out in our homes and moving forward into the community and helping out. So there's no phone booth with a cape in it. We just need ordinary people to help us do some extraordinary thing and help, help us help you. You are the community. So, and you're part of the NAACP. You're already, the, you made the first step. You came out and you joined the NAACP. So you want to help and uh, we need the help and, and we appreciate everybody. Uh, all your commitment uh, and everything that you're already doing, but we do need people on the committees. We're gonna be sending out uh, some emails uh, with some flyers, how to register, things about our website and, and additional information, and also getting uh, responses of how we can serve better. But, uh, but please join, ask your friends to join. Uh, Mr. Johnson, he gave a great presentation. He's gonna be out there doing, doing what he needs to do, the, the, the Gandam membership, but, uh, we need the committee staff. Um, and that's all I have. Uh, any questions before we close out? Any statements? Any new business? Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks to media for being here. Thanks our special guests for being here. Thank you, everybody. And I move that we adjourn the meeting.
Bye, guys. Bye bye. bye. Nice seeing second. you guys. Bye, bye everyone. everyone. It was a pleasure. Thank sure you. Was. See you both. Thank you, Karen Blanding, Mrs. Blanding. Thank you from Rome That's Branch. So thank you, Rome. Great meeting. Great pre <laughs> yeah, presentations. And I see your two committees that we heard. Y'all are on fire. Y'all going to be all right. But thank y'all right. all. Oh, we'll very apologize much. for all the glitches. <laughs> I mean, I'm that's a great, great job, everybody. That's why great we got. That's why we everyone. do it. <laughs> it was great a great job, everyone. For the first, first meeting, great. great. And Miss Brown, we need to talk. I apologize. We need to talk. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll be seeing you now. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you, guys. Everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Have a great good job. day. Bye bye. Bye bye. You too. Oh, you too. You too. Okay. How do I do here? Hello, Claire. Miss Claire. <laughs> oh, hi, Barbara. Dr. Hi. Bredier. Hi. Busy maneuvering this uh, Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Oh, goodness. Um, uh, I'll speak to you. Trying to get on the national board meeting. Thanks for coming, Terrell. Good to see you again. Oh, look, you have a young guy there. He can be on a committee. <laughs> Terrell. Okay, have a great weekend, everybody. How y'all doing? <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> I know. Like, on the finance committee. Terrell, some young people. Oh, yeah. We coming. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. Y'all have a great weekend, all right? Thank okay. you. Okay. Have a good day. Hello, Miss Singer. I hope you was able to record you and WHEC. Uh, I I was actually. I'm just sending Mr. Singleton a text right now to set up when we can have a conversation. So I'm just about to send him a text. He's just about to look down at his phone and go, "Oh, I have a text." <laughs> okay. Uh, what about you, we'll WHEC? Fifteen minutes. Record. I'm sorry. What's that? I was talking to Channel 10, WHEC. Okay, well, are we doing interview now? Is this the... No. Um, I think so you may have to call him unless you do your own Zoom because this is being recorded and I'm going to start the recording as soon as everyone is off. Yeah. Um, but I see the TVs are still on. I'm still here. I know lots of people have questions about the, you know, leadership change that's why i thought that was going to be addressed today uh so i think maybe that's why channel 10 is still hanging out i'm not sure i can't speak for them well you you need to the president is still on maybe you can um give him a call yes you can uh, you can give me a call give me a call in yeah give me a call right now right now okay all right coming at you thank you okay bye-bye bye-bye all right, so everybody have a good day. I am about to end the meeting. Okay, thanks. Thanks for, thanks for all the effort. Bye-bye. Okay.